So many grimoires, so little time. Grimoires I don't run out of time, I do. So I'm gonna get try to get back on schedule on here. I missed last week, and uh, I don't want to make that a habit. But things happen, you know. So today I'm gonna continue with another interesting little grimoire called the Liber Salomonis, Sefer Raziel, original edition 15th century, new edition 2016, edited by Tarl Warwick. And there's plenty of interesting stuff in here to say the least. I know not too many people listen to this, but my hope is that over time that will change. For now, I'm actually just enjoying quite a bit doing this at all. Reading these, taking them in, and enjoying them along with you. Nothing wrong with that, right? But I'm sure I'll get a few more years down the line. The stranger the world gets, the more answers we seek. The more answers we seek, the stranger our adventures. For one cannot find strange answers without strange action. At least that's my opinion. So, let me give you a little rundown of what the Liber Salomonis is about. The Liber Salomonis. Referred to it sorry, referred to in its own composition as the Zephyr Raziel, claims to be a book given directly to King Solomon by a mysterious prince and sorcerer from the East, actually written in the Renaissance or perhaps as early as the medieval period. It synthesizes Kabbalistic and Hermetic lore together and is divided into seven treatises. The subject matter ranges from the high occult of invocation and the names of angels and of the Judeo-Christian God, to herbal medicine and the creation of incense for the calling of spirits, to the categorization of 24 beasts and stones to coincide within the hours of the day, with the entire core of the work ruled over by seven angels and seven celestial bodies. The philosophy behind it, some what ap ap uh, apocryphal? <laughs> Historical content is nonetheless of extreme interest, and is here presented in modernized English for the entire modern audience. Good. One thing I'd like to mention that I don't think I have before is that um, Tarl Warwick does a very good job of introducing a lot of these things. Besides the synopsis that I just read to you, um, generally most of them have some kind of introductory section in which uh, information is discussed about the context of its creation, uh, its use, and so on. Uh, I don't read that stuff because I want you to purchase it and give it a read yourself. That's original work by him that I don't want to tamper with. Liber Salomonis, in the name of Almighty God, living and everlasting, and without end, which is called Adne, Sade, Ihe, Asade, I begin this book, which is called Sefer Raziel, with all his appurtenances, in which there are seven treatises, complete or fulfilled, that is, seven books. Solomon said glory and praising and much honor to be to the God of all creatures, he that is singular, which made all things at one time. And he is one God, very mighty, he alone that is, and that was, and which every one shall be, and which had never an equal or any like him, neither will he ever have. And he is singular without end, Lord alone, without corruption, holy, clean, meek, and great in all things seeing and hearing and understanding and all things mighty and I begin this book to make an example that whomever that has it blame it not till he has read and heard all or some of it and then praise be to God maker of all things <laughs> it's an interesting little passage 
I want to reread that. And I begin this book to make an example that whoever has it, blame it not till he has read and heard all of or some of it. It's a weird little sentence, isn't it? There are the nine precepts. Be faithful, not to many gods, but to one singular god alone. Creator of all things, which has none like him, and he shall love you. And dread and honor with all trust and with good will and constancy and with a clean heart. Be not without lawfulness, and you shall be loved of God thy creator and of his people. Do not do to another man that which he has done unto you wrongfully. Do not do to another man that which you would not wish be done to you. Do not lie to the Lord, neither to your friend, and say and do things which shall profit rather than harm. Take counsel with wise men and not with the unwise, and evermore love wisdom and the sciences, and face place all your will and life into them. Do not speak before you think. Consider things with your heart before you do them as well. Do not reveal your secrets to a woman, child, fool, or drunk. Do not prove a poison or medicine in yourself before it is proven in another. Until you have proved a book or wise man, do not reject them. And if you adhere to these nine precepts, and that evermore you will profit after that, wit and knowledge and might and willpower overcome all things with good wit and good discretion. Therefore, I will expound and open this book, which is of great power and of great virtue. I, Solomon, put such knowledge and such distinction and explanation in the book to every man that has read or studied it, that he may know whereof he was and from where he came. Know that after I, Solomon, had attained many years in the fifth day of the month, the sun being in the sign of Leonis, on that day was sent to me from Babylon some prince that was greater and more powerful than all men of his time, the book that is called the Zephyr Raziel, which contains seven books and seven treatises. Know that the time in which Solomon gave this book, how and of whom to give it to, to him, this book is of great virtue and of great power. The name of the prince that sent it to me was Samton, and one of the pair of wise men that brought it to me was called Kar Karmazayo, and the other was named Zazont. The name of this expounded in Latin is Angelus Magnus Secrete Creatoris, that is to say, the great angel, the secret creator, and a Hebrew Zephyr Raziel, that is the book of foretelling and fulfilling, and it was the first book made after Adam, written in language of Chaldean. Afterward, it was translated to Hebrew, and know each man that reads it, that in it is all Semaphorax, that is great name complete, with all his names, whole and perfect, and with his virtues and his sacraments. I found it in seven books, that is seven treatises. And know that I found the first and the very last very difficult, and those in the middle of the book more plain. And although I found them difficult, I expounded them as much as I could and might. And the seven treatises of this book are as follows. The first is called Clavis, for that in it is determined astronomy, for which stars nothing can be done. The second is Allah, for that is in determined the virtues of plants, animals, and minerals. The third is called Dia Timia Matus, which refers to fumigations and dilutions. The fourth is called the Treatise of the Months and Days, for there it is determined in which everything ought to be done by this book. The fifth is called the Treatise of Cleanliness, Cleanliness and refers and determines periods of abstinence. The sixth is called Samain, and it names the heavens, their angels, and their powers. The seventh is the Book of Virtues, and lists the virtues and miracles, their properties, and the figures of the heavens. And then I began to write all these treatises in a new volume for any single treatise without the others is insufficient. Therefore I made here the entire compilation to be made of seven treatises. Therefore Solomon bade to his writer clarification that he should write it, since he was skilled in the language of, Ch of the Chaldeans. I hope I'm saying that right. Of the Indians and as well as the Syriac and Hebrew. After this Solomon ordained the book 
once clarification said corrected it and compiled the work that it might serve more ably. Clarification said to Solomon that the book was of great virtue, purity, and full honor. It was sent to Solomon for a great price and much love, and every treatise contained was written singularly. But although it is to be sought in to be one book alone by itself in complete form, for none of those should suffice without another, it is necessary that they be together. So it kind of goes on for a little bit. And after that, it starts breaking down some of the different treatises that it mentions. Clavis and some of the others. The book itself is about 85 pages or so. I'm trying to kind of skip toward the second and third. Considering that Solomon himself said the first was difficult, I'm guessing it's going to be a little bit of a dry read. So I am skipping to the second treatise. Treatise. Doesn't matter. Allah. Solomon said, as the wings of birds be members that lead the beings to the place where they desire to be. So by virtue of stones and of herbs and of beasts that fly or swim or creep, you might attain to the attributes of the wolf. You choose the nature of the same, the properties and virtues, and therefore we call this book Allah, that is, of the wings, for without wings never birds nor fishes can move at all. And so the wings bear the bodies to the sky upward and to the ground downward, and side to side, so by the virtues of stones and of the herbs with grace and with much might of sem semiphoras, know that you might attain the ability to heal or make sick or to move or remain still. Solomon said, that stones be cleaner and fairer than gold, and in the four virtues of the world, as be stones, herbs, words, and beasts, I say that in the beginning this book, Sepharasiel, was crowned with seven stones of great power, and he put them in his book. The first is a ruby, the second is an emerald, the third is a sapphire, the fourth is a beryl, the fifth is a topaz, the sixth is a jacinth, the seventh is an orichalc, orichalc, and of the virtues of these stones, Raziel has said that were crowned of seven angels, which hold power over the seven heavens and seven days of the week. And Raziel said, Know that each man that has this book, that in this book be the great virtues of this world. And the first virtues of this book, that is said of four wings, be the virtues of stones. Wherefore, know that by stones alone you can do wonderful things, if you know well what to do with the images here if you keep them cleanly and reverently. And Solomon said, Know that in the first Allah, or wing, be twenty-four precious stones, great and of great power, to similitude, and they signify that there be twenty-four hours in the day and night. Solomon began and said, I put the first stone of the ruby, I, I put the first stone of ruby, for that it is brighter and clearer, and fairer and of the most price above all stones. And I will speak now for its color and its power and its virtue, and of his seal and of his figure that ought to be in it. And thus I shall say in all other stones, each stone signifies stability without end. The color of ruby is as of the color of fire, and its power it is that it shines by night, as a star or as a flame. And the virtue of it is that it makes good color of men and that bear it reverently. And it increases his good un of this world, among other men. And the image which you ought to put in the same ought to be as Draco, that is, a dragon of terrifying power. And it looks like he kind of keeps going here with Topaz, the Emerald, Jacinth, Fifth Stone, Sixth Stone, Sapphire, and finally the Barrel, and then the Onyx. On the 8th, 9th, Carnelian, Chrysolite, the 11th, the Bloodstone. He describes a variety of properties regarding it. Well, let's the for example. The 11th stone is called Bloodstone, and it is a stone of great power, of which the color is green and fair with red drops inside like drops of blood. This stone is called the Stone of Wise Men, and Prophets, and the Philosophers, and this... Uh, 
And this is honored for two things, for the color like to emerald and its greens, and like ruby and its red. The price of the stone overcomes the price of all others. The price of the stone overcomes the price of all others. Well, he previously stated that the ruby was the highest price, but and of its virtues and proprieties. The power of the stone is that it be put away in any broad vessel full of water in the sun if it rises the water, and it makes it to be raised upward till that into the rain it is converted, thus coming back down as such. Its virtue is that to that so it's, I think it's stating that the bloodstone will evaporate as long as it's mixed into water. I mean, I'm, perhaps if it's the smallest particles, but I'm, I'm unsure how that might work. Its virtue is that who that bears it in the mouth or in the hand closed may not be seen of any man. With that stone, a man may have the power upon all devils and make each incantation or enchantment that he desires, and the stone ought to be graven the evening star. It's a powerful little stone, isn't it? Goes on the quartz, iris, jasper, prosin, cattle, the tortoise shell, chalcedony, amethyst. Well, here the twenty, the twenty-second stone is amethyst, and it has the color of wine upon a white cloth, or of rose, or violet, and this has might to chase away fiends and its virtue to defend from drunkenness, and its figure is Ursa, that is a bur, a bur, a bear. So this is interesting, I mean, considering how old the book is, 15th century, we get a nice rundown of the stones and their virtues and benefits and powers and such. I, uh, if you're, I guess, going to take anyone's advice uh, regarding stones, wouldn't it be bad to use this text considering its age? But... I'm sure there's plenty that predate it that discuss stones as well. Hmm. Let's see here. So the majority of the solace section is herb-based and stone-based. After that, he moves on to herbs. The first is called rosemary. This herb is a small bush with a fine fragrance and little leaves, and its power is to invigorate and clarify the brain. And if a house is fumigated with it, it chases demons away. The same also does the peony. Second herb, Artemisia. Then cannabis. Ooh, let's see what he says about cannabis. The third herb is cannabis. It is long in its stem and can be made into cloth. The virtue of the juice of cannabis is to anoint yourself with it and stand before a mirror made of fine steel. And you can then call the spirits forth to their images and will see them visibly and will be able to bind or call demons. So there you go. I guess there's an even better use to cannabis than we ever thought. Cardamom, coriander, sage, a classic, which has great ability to chase insects away, and its virtue is to break the stone in the bladder of him that uses it. Okay, so stones. There you go. Kidney stones, things like that. Might be able to help out. You got parsley, coriandrum, so it's what is, uh, hyssop, psyllium, jorum. The 16th is tarragon. This is of great power. And that it may be mixed with the snake's tongue to cause bleeding. And the herbs should be gathered when the sun is in Cancer and the moon is in Mercury. Or is in the house of Mercury and joined with him. Know that the bear can cause anyone to befriend him. And Hermes said that it gathers together winds and spirits if mandrake is added to it and the ointment. Oh, and then we have catnip, linseed, salvia, semina, uh, nasturtium. I'm unfamiliar with that one. Kana, calamus, chicory, and so on and so forth. The 24 virtues and herbs as the stones. And they are considered wings, or the word ala, A L A. Interesting. After that, we have a list of beasts. So, you know, 1 through 24, I'm assuming again, 
The fifth beast or vision is a fantasy that is a shade to the similitude of many colors or many types gathered together, and this form is made in desert places or in corrupt air, or sometimes it descends from the hills to the similitude or likeness of knights, and they be called exer exercitus antiquus, that is, an old host. And sometimes it comes upon waters to the similitude of fair women, well clothed, and some say it that they be faces, and sometimes such an illusion strikes in a man of corruption or malice or comp complexions, and of humors that be in the man's fantasy. Uh, the sixth beast is called the demon. This descends in highness to lowness, and he was formed of pure matter, without corruption. Wherefore he fails not, but shall evermore endure, although he has taken thickness and darkness of the lowness of the earth. He is pure in matter, and strong in body regardless. And of this says the wise man, that he knows all things that are. And by him philosophers have answers, and wise men of all things, of which they will know the day. And he dwells evermore in darkness, and in obscurity, and he is never secured from them. And of this, and of this says the prophet, that the demon has the power of taking forms or shapes, which he wishes while in the earth after the will of the creator and he is called a bright jewel mighty and fair as the form of the sun and of the moon and of the stars or of an angel or of a cloud or of a bird or of a fish or of a man or of a beast or of a reptile that is creeping beast or any other form which he wishes and all these above said without them know that they be impalpable or unable to be felt directly, that is, that they may not be held with one's hand, neither be touched with one's foot, or they be spirits or wind. And know that every one of them above, when it descends into in any of the elements, it will form a body of them. Although the life of them be of the fire, and the dwelling of them be in the fire, and their deeds are fiery. For that is what they are composed of. And Raziel said upon these six, in order to call these invocation or conjuring, and to do good or evil by binding and loosing them, all must proceed with clean, cleanliness. Who that would call or have service of them must do with orison and fasting and fumigation, and with praising of God, as you will see here furthermore. One thing I've always found fascinating about Grimars is uh, the summoning or the invocation, if you will, of demons always doesn't always but in the case of many of these older grimoires requires the power permission authority uh, concentrated sourcing of energy or the will of a monotheistic god of all power so it's interesting to note that in a lot of these older grimoires you have access and availability to demons, but only via the permission of God. But nonetheless, you have God-fearing individuals summoning and invocating the powers of demons and seeing absolutely no issue with that because to them, it is merely a tool. It is another beast, another creation of the Almighty that is there for humanity to shape it w to its will for we are it's we are god's reflection and so on and so forth so it's interesting it's interesting um because you know as the occult became more and more atheistic um separated from the church um, obviously shunned uh, furthermore and time went on um a lot of these ideas have fallen to the wayside and modern occultists um so I, i'm not sure how to feel about that in particular it doesn't make it any more or less legitimate because i think um a lot of these groups are aware of these connections it's just they have chosen to stray away from this idea of having to find divine authority to gain permission to have access to these particular types of demons or entities and such they didn't secularize well in a way a lot of it became secularized oddly enough considering we're talking about the occult but um 
more or less became separated over time. Um, there's still people, obviously, that still practice it in this manner. Um, but in most cases, anytime I've read invocations of demons or summoning of demons, it it specifies that um, human beings are above demons, and thus we can control them, for they are jealous of our existence, and thus by invoking their name, or by saying their name, or being aware of their name when they approach you, or when you summon them, you show them some truth that allows you to control them as they believe you have more truth than you let on. If you know one truth, you will know all. Or you may know all. That's how it goes. But um, generally, you don't see any kind of uh, reference to an almighty god or some kind of monotheistic deity that actually is the reason you are capable or are given permission to control said demons. That, that you don't see as often anymore. But I guess it depends on where you look. So it's really interesting because it's not the first time I've seen this in the, these older grimoires. It's kind of exciting to see the way thinking has changed quite significantly. Well, let me move on. So, after that you have fowls, fish, lists of fish, all their corresponding um, powers, virtues, and so on and so forth. And then, um, that's when the second book ends. And you move on to the, well, it has a difficult name. Timia Matus. Oh no, it's not that bad. It just looks bad. Timia Matus. The angel said to Adam, make the Miyamata. The Miyamata be connections of good odors with which you will suffume, suffume and please creation. And you will attain that which you wish by your work and the materials which they may be made precious things which you find be they of good odor and of good nature and of clean things and when you do this to be clean and without all filth and then the angel rested in that hour and adam remained and did that he might and this solomon expounded and said i marvel why this in the book of moses also for the creator said to moses make thee miyamata and suffume the hill where you would speak to me Wherefore Solomon said that fumigations and sacrifice and unction together open the gates of the air and of the fire and of the gate of all other heavens. And by these fumigations a man may see heavenly things and the many levels of the Creator. And each man knows that they till the earth, water, and lower places. And Solomon said, as there be seven heavens and seven stars and seven days in the week, of which each one is distinct and is not likened to his even. So know thus each man that there be seven fumigations which withhold with them the virtue of the seven stars and make glad the spirits of the air. And the angels of heavens and the devils of angels of the world and therefore for man yields to them that which is theirs. Therefore they be pleased and glad for the words which you say when pray or say their names or the names of the Creator, and for this that you do when you wash yourself, and for the gift that you give when you fumigate. And these things yield them into tangible form, so that they may appear to you. And the spiritual and invisible, that is, that neither evil men, neither beasts, might see you if you keep yourself strong in this way. Tiamiyamata is made of many things, and these be principles upon the seven days of the week. And first we speak of the Theomiyamata of Saturday, for the star of him is higher and the angel most mighty. So, from what I take on that, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's this idea, again, as I mentioned before, that I guess praises unto the Lord God, the Almighty, and so on, please both the ears. Well, I mean, based on what I see, both devils and angels themselves, I guess, respect those praises, as they are praises to the very being that created or controls them. And by keeping yourself nice and clean and making things smell like they should, the environment, um, you have access to these beings. 
but it still requires a certain amount of respect you need to show them even if you have the power to invoke them or somewhat ask of them what you want and they must oblige as long as you follow the appropriate measures so there's a lot of contractual obligation occurring here on both the part of the human as well as the devil or angel it's almost as if uh, some almighty being created some contracts that are unbreakable or they're breakable but with many consequences so it incentivizes both angel devil and human to follow those obligations when any one of them have access to each other so if humans want this and they have to give the devils this or they have to give the angels that or they have to show this kind of respect or that kind of respect and so on and so forth it's kind of, it's an interesting dynamic that uh, a lot of these old grimoires um talk about you know a lot of the language is archaic but the the point is there it's a universal golden rule mixed with contractual like uh, what a, what's the word i'm looking for um social contracts yeah it's like a social contract like we have amongst human beings like you know you have certain expectations you have of the human beings um such as you know they will work they will pay taxes when you cross the street they will follow the laws they won't run you over um they won't steal from you they won't murder you because those laws are are there these contracts are there and outside of the law itself enforcing them um, there's a certain level of almost assumption that a specific amount of this these rules will be followed otherwise everything falls apart and it's not beneficial for any of the parties involved law and order of course keeps that further intact but the social contracts themselves exist for very important reasons and um well, this essentially is a form of cosmic or divine social contract between beings from otherworldly places and humans and the such. Um, and the treatises are almost like the same ones you would find between nations. Agreements um, that have predetermined how events are supposed to unfold when interactions occur. It's all very interesting. So, I mean, even time and space is involved. As it mentioned, all the fumigation of areas, so that's space. Keeping it clean. Keeping yourself clean. Your body clean. So, inner space of sorts. The mind clean. Um, inviting for those who would approach you. Especially those in these cosmic contracts that you must abide by in order to avoid any unwanted consequences for even then there are rules to those consequences which is interesting as well um, as far as time being involved besides space you of course have specific days specific um, specific uh, times of the day uh, events uh, and so on in which particular contracts are better established or better fulfilled um, or, in fact, have to do with the contract itself. So, you know, if you agreed, uh, at some point it was agreed that a specific type of invocation is supposed to occur, occur during a certain time, during a certain place, um, all that has to be kind of done in order for the contract or the, the invocation or otherwise to be fulfilled properly. I mean... What's interesting about all this is, of course, just like, you know, in the human world, you have black markets and such, and I'm sure um, you have devils or angels or humans that um, approach these subjects, in, not incorrectly, but have an uh, opposition to doing it in the almighty-approved ways. And so I think that's how you get a lot of these break-offs in the occult. You know, there were certain rules and ideas, and so then you have new philosophies and uh, almost like a challenging of this sort of legitimacy 
that is established in a grimoire like this one in the 15th century about how certain things should be handled. Uh, a lot of people th have this really rigid view of the occult in which they think that, oh, I mean, well, this is how it was done, so this is the best way to do it. That usually probably is the case, considering that it's closer to whatever source or time in which it was initially created or established or uh, that knowledge was you know, stumbled upon. But things occur, things change. Alterations occur. Events in the universe itself or on Earth may alter whatever established agreements um, might have been valid at one point but start becoming less so in the future. I don't think, just like the human world, I don't think any particular contract or um, stipulations about a certain agreement never change. You almost have to have it change over time. Because otherwise, you know, it can't adapt to whatever uncontrolled aspects of the environment may occur. Rebellion is always around the corner. So a lot of these changes will happen whether um, you know the Almighty or otherwise likes it or not. Not everyone, including devils, like to be um, stifled by a specific set of rules for all eternity. That's generally not the uh, imperative of creatures of any kind of free will or perceived free will. Anyway, I went off on a crazy tangent. The book continues on the Book of Virtues. It lists uh, virtues, it lists times, locations in which things must happen. Uh, here we have the list of the four names of the Creator. Johak, Jonah, Eloi, and Yena. So, um, you have... Here, I'm missing here. Oh, just kind of skipped ahead here a little bit. That's not what I was looking to do. And in the final section, it mentions uh, of a struggle. Thank we kings to the Lord Jesus Christ, Father and Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Which lives and reigns forever endlessly. It is finished. I like how it ends with a praise unto Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just fascinating to me considering how much of this uh, information would be thought to be heretical amongst most groups that would praise said Jesus Christ and um, and so on. In any case, I hope you enjoyed some of the reading in there and some of the discussion, well, not discussion, but some of my ranting and raving pertaining to it. I hope to hear from you guys again. Leave any comments if you're interested or uh, tell me what books you might be interested in me reading. Uh, grimoires, preferably. The older, the better. Um, but still, I like to take suggestions for future videos. Thank you. Aside from that, um, I'm going to go ahead and continue.